Glory to God. Man. Now, tonight, God just, man, oh, this week, he's just been ministering to me. And so I came in uh, Monday night. And sometimes Monday night, you can get a, if I start praying, I'm praying a glimpse of what I'm going to share on Wednesday night. And uh, it was like that. Uh, God just started ministering to me and uh, uh, opening my eyes to some things. And, and when you're fasting, uh, you sort of have a tendency to you see differently. Uh, God gets, allows you to see a little bit different. Now, now, some people fast just not to eat and lose weight. Uh, but I was just seeking God, saying, God, I want to get closer. I know that uh, that demands a sacrifice somewhere, uh, denying or pushing away the plate. And so uh, it can be for uh, whatever length of time you just sense God is saying to you or you want to go. But you you got to ask God, Lord, I don't know how to get close to you. Because how many of you know you don't know how to get close to God? If you knew, you would be closer. You would be so close, you wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> but you are among the heathens tonight <laughs> who are at a distance and we're working at getting closer and closer and closer to the Father. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm in, a, in a mix here because I don't know what to share in terms of the first part, the second part, the third part, or the fourth part. But I just, I just, yeah, we need the Holy Spirit because I'm, I'm excited about the whole thing. If it was me, I would preach the whole Bible tonight, but I don't think you want to stay here that long. <laughs> but I'm, I'm at that point. I'm like, okay, God, what do I do? What do I share? And so, uh, uh, yeah, Lord, I'll just share a little bit of this uh, first and uh, try to go into this thing uh, and reveal what God is saying. Now, if you, you're ready to hear the word of God, I want you to high five somebody and say, I love you and take your seat. This is a wonderful day. Glory to God. Elder Sparkman ministered a powerful word here on Sunday. Glory to God. And uh, Elder or Pastor Bennett ministered a powerful word in Alamo. I know he preached his heart out there. And uh, we're trying to encourage some of the people who are up there in Alamogordo to go to church up there. And uh, we see them here, but we want them because we're not somebody who says, hey, look, this one church in multiple locations. And so I, I, I want people to, uh, to get up there and they can see. And Now, we can't make people do it, uh, but uh, I can say if you want to look at somebody better preaching, that's the guy. He can preach better than I can. I, I may look better, but... <laughs> but he preaches better. Now, I'm not saying he has more wisdom than I do, but he can preach better. He, whenever we have him down here, you all love him. You just kick me to the curb. And like, like, let the old guy go over there. And, and, and I'm not old yet. I'm, I'm still young, but you're, you're like, you know, let the young guy come in and let's, let's give him a chance. Praise the Lord. So my message tonight, I, I, I don't, if you can make sure I'm not going to, in the house, I'm not, I don't want to, because y'all know my voice goes up, uh, sound man, I want to make sure that I'm not too loud. Are, am I too loud in the house? Glory to God. Sound man up here, can you bring me down a little up here? Glory to God. That's the guy on the monitors, and uh I like hearing myself, but not that much. I'd rather hear myself sing than preach, because I think I'm a good singer. You know, I don't know if my wife deceived me or what, but before we got married, she loved my singing. Now that we're married, she just likes my legs. I, I don't know, you know. <laughs> Glory to God. But my message tonight, tonight uh, 
I don't think it's going to necessarily inspire you more than it will provoke you. And that's what we want. We want God to provoke us to things so, so, so that, uh, but that provoking is not in a bad way. So you don't have to think, oh man, is he going to get us upset and inflame us and piss us off a little bit? And, and, and by the way, I didn't cuss when I said piss us off. That just simply means angry. <laughs> Glory to God. But I want to get you motivated in a good way to pray for a deeper hunger for God, to ask God, God, take us deeper. Now, the Bible says, he that know their God, who know their God, who know their God, shall do great exploits. Now, you're going to have to talk back to me. Now, don't forget, you got to respond, because if you don't, you're giving me a clue that I have to expound on some of the verses, because you, you're not aware of some of those verses and you haven't read them and so I got to go in to, uh, to get you to understand and, and go into the explanations and you don't want that tonight do you? Okay so I'm going to preach longer tonight because there are not enough people <laughs> responding but if you talk back to me if you talk back to me in this house I believe you can get fed because it's hard to feed a closed mouth Amen. okay alright you get there it's hard to feed somebody that, that their mouths are closed. So for you, some of you, don't let your titles weigh you down. Open your mouth and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah! Glory to God. Let me say something before I really get into this word. There, there, are, there are many people with titles, but don't carry the DNA of that title. We got a lot of prophets that don't carry the DNA, the preachers that don't carry the DNA, a lot of people. And the church is full of talented people, but they're emptied of the anointing that breaks the yoke. And that's why you can hear fabulous singing, but no anointing. And the church is on dangerous ground because it's accepted the talent and rejected the anointing. And that's what we see. We see it in churches. I'd rather hire you to sing for me than to be anointed to break things over me. Glory to God. And so to know God is to know our purpose as well. We need to know what we're here for. So can I tell you when, 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 when a couple really know each other, when a husband and a wife is fully aware of what their purpose and design is, the wife that, that comes from the rib knows that she is there and she comes from the rib for a reason because she protects the vital parts of the body. When she understands that, she'll protect her heart, the, the husband's heart. The man, when he understands his role, he'll understand his feet is to crush the head of the serpent, not his wife's. Wow. Amen. Amen. So I need you to hear the word and hear what God is saying tonight. I believe God has something for you and it's going to bless your heart. Now turn to Jude, or Judges rather. Judges, the second chapter. I'm going to read real fast. Second chapter, the eighth verse. It says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of the inheritance of Timnat, Harris in the mountains of Ephraim on the side or the north side of Mount Gaash. And when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who died, who did not know the Lord, that who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. When the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, they, 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 they forsook the Lord God of their, the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord. I want to stop there. They forsook the Lord. Now go to Jeremiah, the fourth chapter, the twenty-second verse. It says. For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil 
but to do good they have no knowledge. Now over in Jeremiah 9 and 23 it says, Thus says the Lord, God is speaking now through the prophet, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Let him glory that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. So his delight is in you knowing him. Hosea, the sixth chapter, the sixth verse says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So God wants you to know him more than anything. And so let me talk to you tonight about the premier desire that God has for you to know him and the utmost need that for you to know God. Because the greatest desire God has for man is to know him. And that is your greatest need. So to have a working knowledge of our Lord's saving power is essential because an unknown God cannot be trusted. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You'll never fully trust a person whose character is not revealed. The Bible shows us, tells us that Paul was one day walking along a path. And it says he started talking and he was talking to some people of that country. And he said, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, do, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life to all, breathe, breath, excuse me, and breath and all things. And he has made from everyone, one, from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him, that they may, like someone blind, searching for him. Paul is saying that they may grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of you, your own prophets have said, for we are his offspring. Now that's over in Acts, I believe the 17th chapter. Paul was saying that, I'm noticing as you are worshiping here, you're worshiping an unknown God. I saw the inscription and it says to the own unknown God, how do you worship an unknown God who is not known? How do you put focus on someone that has no history with you? And so many of us are sitting here thinking, why am I hearing this message about knowing God? I know God. I know God. Let me suggest to you, you may know God to a degree, and that's small. But most of us only know about him. And so my answer is, really, do you think you really, really do know God? And that's the tragedy, I think, that we see today. Let me ask you this question. Then if you know God, then on what level do you know him? If there are depths and lengths and breaths and heights, then to what degree do you know him? Because if you say that you know him because you feel him, then you can't know him that way. Because I can, in my early days of being a young man, I, I knew a lot of other women 
and they, they knew me to a degree, but they, that didn't mean that they were my wife. You see, you can know about somebody and not know them. Are you listening to me? God reveals himself to every generation anew and afresh. And, I, and, and God said, I am the God of Abraham. That's an introduction. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Jacob. He's introducing himself. He even says, I'm not the God of the dead. I am the God of the living. God gives all of us an opportunity or a chance to know him. But the key that God, to the, us knowing him is that God only reveals himself to a certain degree. He cannot reveal all of himself to us or we will die. And too many of us are yet unwilling to die because the Bible says, no man has ever seen me and lived. Anybody dead in here? You see, you, you and I can encounter him, but we don't know him to the degree where we have died with him in reality. So it doesn't matter how much you or Bishop Tutu or Mr. Anointed says that they know God, you don't know God to the degree that you think you know God. Even the Bible is quick to tell us, Paul said, your eyes have not seen, nor your ears have heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And so we only get glimpses of God and waves of, of his spirit, and we cry and we praise and we shout, but that's just a glimpse of who God is. In fact, if you think you know God because you shouted, you're sadly mistaken. If you, if you got a glimpse of God and you shouted or you cried, God just simply stepped out and introduced himself to you. That's all he did. But that still doesn't mean that you know him. So you can, you, can, you can talk to people and tell people all the time, oh, I know God. Oh, I'm, I think God would have to ask then, well, how do you know me? We know that Jesus, even walking with the disciples, asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And none of them had an answer. Then he asked them personally, who, the, who do they say he is? And none of them had an answer. None of them. Peter didn't have an answer. God gave it to him. And that's when Jesus said, ooh, my father revealed that to you. There is no other way that you can get to know who I am except my father expose who I am. So Mr. and Mrs. Theologian, when you meet somebody for the first time, you can't say I know them. We love to drop dimes and names. Oh, I know this person. No, you met them or you sat near them in a restaurant, but you don't know them. You don't know their passion. You don't know their heart. Are you listening to me? Everyone you see in the Bible, whoever encountered God fell on their faces and trembled and with great terror, they wept and they cried because the, the, the God of the universe stepped in and said, I know you, but would you like to know me? We want to know God. We just don't know to what degree we're willing to know, want to know him. And so the place God is taking us is supernatural. It's a, it's a supernatural place. It's a glorious place. It's a dynamic place. But it's also dangerous. Because people who have learned how to do for God have not learned yet how to be for God. Please help me. If, 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 if we end up going into the supernatural realm where God wants us to take, what, where he wants to take us, and we know more about doing than we know about being, then it's going to be a disaster. And the reason is because most of us will end up shipwrecked because the spiritual gifts are heavy things to operate when you don't know God. That's why you got people who go into the spirit realm and they go without God, they go with Satan. 
he can take you there too. Yes. He can't take you close to God, but he can take you in the spirit. Yes. Okay, y'all don't want to hear that. Yes, yes. We don't know the difference between knowing God and knowing about God. Because who in their right mind that I know can tell you I really know God? No, truly, I really know God. <laughs> How can the finite comprehend the infinite? Do you think that the limited clay, limited clay, can understand the immeasurable, the incalculable, the incomparable God of the universe, both spiritual and physical realm. Do you think you and I can understand him to any degree? No, we can't. We say things like God is big, well, compared to what? Because if God has no form and he doesn't, then what is he big compared to? God is not immense. He's infin infinity. He's in there's a, there's, he, there's, he is infinity, rather. It, he's not just some size that you can measure and say, well, he's this big, or you can look at the, the moon or the stars. And no, no, no. He doesn't, he's not contained in the universe. He contains the universe in himself. All of us is in him. That includes every demon. Everything, every thought, everything is in God. All time and space is in him. And without him, nothing exists. He feels all in all. So what we need is a re-evaluation of how great God is, how awesome God is, how, how glorious God is. Our concept of God is small. Because we constantly like to measure him. That's why we do things for God in measurements. So when you think of God, just think of everything and throw in infinity, times infinity. Because that's how much you cannot describe God. You cannot imagine God. I, I, I would love to say, I can imagine God. No, no, no. You really can't imagine God's greatness because he has, he has not revealed himself to us that way. Yes, sir. He's only revealed us in a, it, to us himself in a minute way because our brain will explode because once he puts that knowledge out there, our brain don't have enough memory capacity to hold it all. If the Bible says that the world cannot contain all the books of what, if, if it was written about what Jesus did on the earth, then just imagine if he told you who he really was. <laughs> as great as your brain is, it doesn't have the capacity to expand that much. Only your spirit man can expand to that degree. And that area is almost completely foreign to us because we don't we, we still try to compute mentally things spiritually so instead of comparing spiritual things to spiritual things we compare physical things to spiritual things oh yeah i know john said something concerning Jesus in, in terms of all the great things that he did. But let me tell you something, God's complaint to his people is that we don't know him. And in most cases, we don't want to know him intimately. Because if any man really wants to know him, we, if we want to follow him, something has to happen. You got to deny yourself. You see, self can't fit into selfless. Right. Yes, sir. Amen. I know, I know. I know we're working on it, God. We're trying our best. That ain't enough. How do you praise and worship God? How do we lift up offerings? How, how do we study God's word and he still says, you don't know me? So you might say things like, I felt the presence of God. That doesn't mean anything. Because, because you can talk in tongues. I don't know if you know this, but you can read the Bible every day. 
That simply means that you're just learning about God. That doesn't mean you know him. When you got baptized with his spirit and, and he introduced his nature into your life and you got to encounter him on a small level, he gave you his Holy Ghost. He, he, he filled you with his spirit, but, but he is saying with, after the infilling of the spirit, the spirit of God says, come on, let me take you deeper into your father. Let me take you a little bit further into God. Let me take you higher into God. Let me teach you how you can learn of God. Come and see how great your father is. Come and let him blow your mind. Let him begin to open you up to things you've never ever thought of. But we're like, okay, Holy Spirit, but stop. Where are we going? You ever been following somebody and you say, hey, well, where are you going? Just follow me. <laughs> the deeper you go, the darker it is. But that's not the same way with God. The deeper you go in God, the higher you go. Uh, now don't just, don't just stay in the book of Acts. Because there is a wonderland of glory beyond the initial infilling of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot take you deeper if you don't want to go. Somebody say, I want to go, Lord. Go. Say, no, Lord, really, I want to go. <laughs> the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, the 10th verse, catch this. He says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. That's not some things of God all things he wants to expose us to all the things of god that he's researched and know of god and yes the deep bottomless and in incomprehensible things of god he wants to ex cause us to explore the depth of god's being man this is awesome when you jump to the 12th verse he says now that we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Can I ask you this? Have you gone so deep into God that God personally showed you what he has for you? Or are you still only responding to what you heard. There's a difference between God, listen, there's a difference between God speaking to you by the prophets versus him taking you in the spirit and showing you things. John saw that. He said, I was in the spirit on the, on, the, on the Lord's day and God took him up in the spirit and he began to say, I saw things that blew my mind, yes. tripped me the heck out. I was, I even found myself as one that could not speak. When he stood before me, that's why if you've ever really truly encountered God, either in a worship service or in a Walmart, you will be on your knees. The Spirit of God has a way that God says, I can only transfer you into my presence by my Spirit. I can't take you there mentally. God says, I don't communicate that way. I'm Spirit. Spirit communicates with spirit, physical with physical. Are you hearing me? So you cannot communicate to God in, with God intellectually. The Holy Spirit can take you so deep into God that you'll wonder, my God, when are my feet going to hit the ground? Or so high, when is my head going to hit the ceiling? You'll find yourself constantly moving deeper and deeper and going up and closer in with God. And the more you get closer into God, the more he yadas you. Now, let me help you. 
944 times the word yada from the Hebrew, which means intimacy, transparency, nakedness. In a real sense, it means to come into. It's, it's like an intercourse. The word is yada. And so God wants to yada you. You can't yada him. <laughs> okay. Let me help you now. Let me show you how this is. You see, anytime a yada occurs, some fruit or birthing occurs. God never will, he will never have intimacy with anybody he can't birth anything through. You can never be barren in worship. You'll always be fruitful when you worship. Are you listening to me? So the word yada means intimate knowledge, nakedness, transparency, face-to-face -face knowledge. It means to penetrate into one's being. Tell me that Moses wasn't one that God said. I talked to everybody else a certain way, but when I talked to Moses, I talked to him face-to-face. -face. I bring him up to the mountains. None of you can go up to the mountains. We're all at the bottom of the mountain and he tells us don't get close. You touch, you touch this, the foot of this mountain, you'll die because it's holy. When God takes you into the holies of holies, you cannot go in there on your own accord. That's why when the high priest would go into the holies of holies to present a sacrifice, he had to have a rope tied around him and bells on that rope so that would let us know as long as he's moving in the holies of holies, that means he's covered and he's not dead. But if you heard a flop and no bells after that, Drag them out. <laughs> That's why the rope was tied around them. Some of us, we, we want to go into the holies of holies and, and we're going to end up dying in the holies of holies. Because it's not a place that you can say is the address, hear me on this, in terms of the temple. It represented the holies of holies where God said, this is where I am. You see, wherever God placed his feet, he's saying to us, I want you to come closer to me because I want to introduce myself to you. I want you to know who I am. I don't want you to just know what I can do. You see, I don't want you to just, just experience certain things for me. I want you to know me. <laughs> So when God yadas you, he will start, you will start thing, seeing things from his perspective because no giant will be too big, no devil too strong, no lie too deceptive, no disease that cannot be healed, no problem too great to solve because if it's not a problem for God, it won't be a problem with you. The reason is that we all too often are religious. And the reason why we have so many religions and so many cults and, and factions is because they don't know God. That's why we keep coming up with all these different religions and all these different factions and all these different names. I'm not just the church of God. I'm the church of God in Christ. I'm not just the church of God in Christ. I'm the church of God in prophecy. I'm not just the church of God. So we got the variations in Baptist churches. I'm not just Baptist. I'm free will Baptist. We're not just free will Baptist. We're Southern Baptist. Hello? We're not just Southern Baptist, but we're spirit filled Baptist. We don't drop the title. And the reason is because we don't know God. Yes. <laughs> God is not religious. That's one of the reasons why we got so much hell raisers in the church. So many hell raisers because people don't know God. If they knew God, they wouldn't be fighting with their words. They would be careful of what they say. People bicker and fight because they don't know God. Now, I'm not saying they didn't meet God. I'm saying they don't know God, but they've met God, and they know God only on a small level. 
So what I'm saying is that they've never allowed God to increase them or to multiply them. They've never been yada. Mm -hmm. When you know God to the extent you think you know him, wake up because there's more to him yes, sir. than you think. Yes, sir. If you can go home and pray, and I'm going to tell you this, and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you into knowing a greater desire to, to seek God, to bring you into that place which only God lives and allow the Spirit of God to take you beyond your issues and, and your church issues and your religious issues and, and all these other lust issues because that's a good indication that we don't know God. We have to get, li listen, we, we have to get people to know God greater than they think they know God. That's a hard thing because everybody thinks, oh no, I know God. Oh no, I know God. Why? Because you felt them? No, because you read the Bible? What, what, what is it? I, I, I'm saying, I, I know God. No, but do you really know God? My question is always this. If you know God, did you know he was there with you while you were sinning? If you know God, did you know he was with you watching pornography on the internet? If you know God, did you know he was there in the bedroom with you with the other woman? Mm. You see, we get saved, we get baptized, we read a few scriptures, and then we, we live our remaining lives at the initial stage of our knowing. Don't want to go any deeper. We learn what not to wear, how not to act, don't cuss, don't fuss. And what are we learning? We're learning the principle of compliance. That's all. We're learning how to be a good Christian. Not having a relationship with God, just a good Christian because we're inundated with doing stuff instead of being what we should be. Because the Bible tells us plain and simple. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments, he says he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. The truth is not in him. To say you know God and still sin. Don't, don't you get up? tripped out on this stuff that people say you can't fall and mess up after you get saved. And this automatically covered. Don't, don't, get, don't get it twisted now. You find too many places where God is making corrections that he says, shall we continue in sin? That grace may abide, abide? God forbid. Hang it up. That's not your place. This is why I believe real prophets don't prophesy what they see in the natural. Because that's not true prophecy. That's gossip. Oh, y'all know some of, some of you had some people come up to you and, and they heard certain things or they saw you or whatever. And they say, well, you know, God is just saying to me, stop that line. God had not said, said nothing to you. You're gossiping. You heard the gossip and you continue to spread the gossip. True prophecy is digging through the trash until you find treasure. That's what real prophecy is. When you don't know certain things, but the Spirit of God reveals it to you because God knows all things. So if you truly want to know the next step for your life, don't ask the doctor. Don't even ask the preacher. Don't ask the prophet. Don't ask, just, just ask God. And what God will do is that God will tell you, I will send a man to you that will point you to your next level. You see, when the children of Israel were crying out in the, in the wilderness, and, and, and not in the wilderness, but in Egypt, God said, I heard their cries. And what he did was he said, I'm going to raise up a man. He took a baby hid him in the, in the Nile River, and then had the, 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 the sister of Pharaoh to catch him. 
and, and bring him and take him in uh, as her own. And then he calls him to go through an identity crisis. Then he calls him to go through a murder situation. Then he calls him to escape from, 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 from Egypt. Uh, and then he calls him to be, uh, find a young lady and marry her. And then he said, now you're ready. And he found him by leading him on the backside of a desert, leading the sheep of his father-in-law because he said, he said, because now I'm going to use you to lead a people. And he said, I'm going to show you who I am. And I'm going to tell you how he showed them. He showed them as a consuming fire. Now people will say, what's a consuming fire if it's consuming, but it doesn't consume anything. He's a consuming fire because you're thinking physically he was burning up the bush and the bush wasn't burning are you hearing me he was burning up the bush the bush wasn't burning he Moses saw him and all of a sudden when he's turned he transitioned and God said that's your transitional move I just caused you to turn towards me the moment he saw the burning bush he walked up to it and the burning bush talked Amen. And God said to him, I'm sending you on a journey because somebody's been crying out, so I'm sending you to somebody. So don't forget whenever he's going to give you a direction, he's not going to have somebody say, I am that next direction. He's going to be somebody that will point you to the next direction. Mm. So my prayer is that you will leave this service with a deep desperation to pursue God like you're gasping for oxygen. Because knowing God is the quintessential of receiving life. The Bible says, quickly, I want you to turn here. Glory to God. Man, I'm moving fast. John, the fifth chapter, starting at the 37th verse. It says, and the Father himself. Somebody say, and the Father himself. Who sent me, Jesus said has testi testified of me, you have neither heard his voice, uh-oh, he's telling us, you haven't heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. So what was he saying here? I need you to catch this. He's, he didn't say that you didn't know the word. He didn't say that you didn't even practice the word. He said that you don't, you don't have the word abiding in you. The word isn't abiding in you. That's why the church can't be full of, 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 of non, the church is full rather of non-committed people because the word has not taken up residence in them. If the word is alive in you, it changes your scope. It changes your view. The father showed us, listen, if the father showed up in the person of Jesus and they didn't recognize him. I said the father, God, showed up in the person of Jesus and they didn't recognize him because they only heard about him. And they never heard his voice and they never seen his shape. So they were great teachers of his book, but they couldn't recognize the teacher. They enjoyed reading the scroll, but, they, but when the author of the book showed up, they didn't give a flip about him. You all know what I'm saying is true. You see, Jesus is the father in the flesh, but they didn't believe that. Jesus was the creator in clay. He's deity in dust. He was the master in a uniform body. The reason why they didn't believe him was because they didn't know who sent him. They were just religious. That's a bad word because the word actually means bondage. So when somebody says, I'm very religious, say, oh, you're very much in bondage then. 
You're locked up. It's, this is how we used to do it. This is how we do it. Mama did it this way. Daddy did it this way. You're in bondage. So you better hurry and get to know God quick because he's about to step out into the miraculous where he's, where if, man, if you step out with him in the miraculous, you're going to hear voices. You're going to experience bumps in the road. You're going to experience obstacles and devils that will challenge you because if you want to know God, it's a matter, it's not a matter of you having losses or crosses. It's a matter of you just surrendering to God because he will ensure that you will have the victory in him and him alone. Now I need to give you this. This is very important. John the fifth chapter says this, John 5 and 39. John started off by saying, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they that testify of me. Now listen, we've concluded that Jesus was saying that search the scriptures and you will have eternal life. Jesus was saying to the scribes and Pharisees that thought that they had eternal life by reading the scriptures. Search the scriptures, but understand that the Bible is not God. I'm about to tear you up now. The Bible is a revelation of the mind and the heart and the will of the Father, but it's not God. You can know the Bible, but not know the God of the Bible. Oh, that's why you have so many people that are religious. They know the word, but the letter kills. But the spirit gives it life. You can memorize and quote scriptures all day long, but there is a difference between quoting the word with a lowercase w and knowing the word with a capital W. In the beginning was the word. Huh. There's, there, there, there's something powerfully different between the printed page and the master of the page. John said this in the next verse. Catch this. Are you still there? 5 and 40 now. It's the next verse. It says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. You're not willing to come to me. You're so caught up in your tradition because you think the tradition or the religion or whatever sect that you're part of is your saving grace. Catholicism is strong on that. They think the church is the saving grace. The religious people think that they have life because they know the Bible to a degree. But you got to be careful that you do not become worshipers of doctrine yes, or Bible worshipers. Right. Worshiping the Bible and thinking that you become enriched and enthroned by God or, or by the book is a mistake. The book doesn't give you salvation. Right, right. Uh-oh. If the Bible doesn't lead you and me to, the, to, to Jesus while we're reading it, we're reading it with the wrong heart. It, it, it's a pointer. Are you listening? So don't play games with your future. You see, it's, it's, it's not about what you quote or quoting the scriptures because that Bible has to take us to Jesus. It has to take us somewhere. But he says... In the 40th verse, catch it again. I need you to read it again. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. What do you mean? What, what, do you mean? what are you saying? You rather read what brings, what, what, what can kill you. Wow. Wow. Now, some of us are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. But this is the Bible. The Bible says, the letter kill it, referring to the word of God. But the spirit gives it life. In other words, the word will never come alive if the spirit of God never makes it alive to you. You got to remember Jesus is talking to, most, to the most religious and well astute and biblically inclined people of his day. And he's telling a bunch of professional churchgoers. 
that they don't love God. Ooh, that's fight words. And he had to encounter that many times. Jesus often would call the 12 disciples to himself so that they could learn of him. But if we don't take the time to be in his presence to learn of him, we will waste our time learning about him. Now stay with me. Huh. The difference in the church of Acts and the present day church is that they had a different knowing of God that, 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 that this present day church doesn't have. Yes, yes. Remember, they didn't have the book of Ephesians, right, right. the book of Philippians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Yes, the first church didn't have that. What they had was the spirit. That was all the life they needed. Not that the word isn't important. You need the word because it's the manual. Yes, sir. But you need the combination of the word and the spirit so that you'll grow up because with just the word, you'll dry up. Yes, with just the spirit, you'll blow up. And that's where they had, in, they had negative encounters because they had all this power, but not a manual in what to do with that power. Yes. So Paul had to write all of these different letters to help them show them how to surrender to the Spirit of God and to show them how to let the Spirit of God rule and, and, and abide with them forever. So I need you to get this. The Bible is not your saving grace. I know that does, doesn't come across well with people that are very religious because they'll say, well, if it wasn't for this Bible, if it wasn't for Jesus, because you don't know which Bible you read anyway. You don't know which word of God you're reading. Everything in your Bible isn't the word of God anyway. Most of it is narratives. Somebody's telling, not that the story isn't important. But they are, in, they, are, they are narratives pointing us. When you read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, God wasn't saying it, Moses was saying it. So how do you know God, Bishop? If, we, if, 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 if we're struggling with this, how, how do we get to this place? Let me tell you, because when... When, when the early church was thrown into prison and they were beaten, they didn't go into a corner sucking their thumbs and curling up like a little baby. They began to sing songs. Praise God. Worship him. And God began to shake the prison doors or he'll send angels to set the captive free. You see, what happens today, <laughs> mm, that's right, babe. What happens today is something totally different. <laughs> because we got to get counseling. Hear me on this. If you want this power and the, and the miraculous to happen in your life, you have to put up with the problems that he sends with, with, those that, with that desire to set you up for the miraculous. Because the mess is what gives you your miracle. You can't have a miracle when everything is perfect. It's not needed. It's not needed when everything is great. It's the problems, it's the troubles that places the demand for miracles. We need the impossible so that the God of the impossible can show up. Man, stay with me. Don't let me lose you. I, I, I don't have much longer. John, the seventh chapter. See, John, John is an interesting character because unlike all the other disciples or people that wrote the, four, the, the other three gospels, which you have, the first gospel is what? Matthew, Matthew what's? Mark, Mark Luke, and Everybody before John described the birth of Christ. Only John described the 
the revelation of Christ. That's why they would start off with Jesus being born of a manger and each one showed and revealed him as some character, an ox or some, some servant. They, they revealed him in some other form. But when John begins to write, he's writing from a revelation standpoint. That means that he went into the spirit realm where the others did not go. Just because they were disciples and just because they walked with him doesn't mean that they were invited into that realm. Only John. That's why he said God called him up and John said I all of a sudden found myself standing and then I fell at his feet and I saw his feet as bronze and his eyes as, as fire. I saw his hair as wool. He was a brother with an afro. I saw him. You see, God gave John an opportunity yes. to know him differently than the other three. All of them walked with Jesus, but none of them walked with him after his death and resurrection, but John. God, that's powerful, sir. So John had a revelation, and that's why he starts off by saying, in the beginning was the word. Can you imagine everybody else saying something different and all of a sudden John comes out, in the beginning was the word. And you're like, that's fascinating. That's powerful, man. And the word was with God. And the word was God. You're like, man, this is incredible. How do you say that? How do you say God? So in John 7 and 25, John is talking again. He says, and some of them from Jerusalem said, he's telling the story. Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? That's a question. However, they said, we know where this, this man is from. We know where he's, he's from. <laughs> but when the Christ comes, this is what they're saying, no one knows where he is from. You see, let me tell you something. They knew about Jesus and his mama and daddy. That's how they knew where he was from. They didn't know the Christ. You see, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Right. <laughs> oh, that's another thing. I remember teaching that years ago. Folk were like, really? I always thought it was his last name. And he signed Jesus Christ. <laughs> he is Jesus the Christ. And the word Christ simply means the anointed one. You want to know something? You want to know something? So was Lucifer. Stop, hammer time. Let me get, let me, I, I, I'll get to you. I'll get to you. I'll get to you. Listen. And Jesus cried out. Look at that 28th verse. As he taught in church, in the temple. Now, he's in church. He's in the most religious place at that time. And he says, you both know me. And you know where I'm from in terms of my mama. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. You see, you know where I came from in terms of through my parents, but you don't know the one I came from my father, it is his seed that was placed in my mama. So on mama's side, I get hungry. But on daddy's side, I'm the everlasting breath, bread. I am, on mama's side, I get thirsty. But on daddy's side, 
I am that which quenches your thirst. You see, you got to know him. There's, there are more facets to him than just the earthly part of him. Are you hearing me? So he says, yeah, you, you, you know about me. You know about where I come from, but you don't know the one who sent me. And therefore, listen, you cannot look at creation and look at all of what God created, the heavens and the earth, like some people are doing, and they're trying to become intimate with God through the trees. They're studying the planets. I, can't, I feel closer to God. The Bible says that the heavens declares the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Catch this. Creation declares, but it doesn't reveal. It declares. There's a difference between declaring something and revealing something. Creation shows the works of God. You can't look at certain things and it's like if I all of a sudden found, let's just say, I'm walking down the street and I find my, a watch and I say, ooh, a watch, a Movado. Oh my God, that's a nice watch. And then I go around and say, I know the one who made it. Just because I wear it, just because I know what's on it, just because I know about who made it, doesn't mean I know the creator of it. You can't look at the stars and the trees and the beautiful colors in the flowers and say you know God. You have to meet the creator for yourself. You have to have more than an encounter. You have to, you've got to be invited into his kingdom, which he does. He even says, I'm going to share my nature with you. Don't you know? He says, I want to share my divine nature with you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to cause you to dwell in my kingdom so you can come in and see me anytime you want. You can come boldly to the throne of grace where you can obtain what? Help and mercy. When? In time of need. You have to allow him into your home, though. It's not one way. That's the, that's the issue. You want it one way. You want God to do all the sacrificing, all the things you want, but you don't want to sacrifice. You don't want to do anything. You don't want to do anything. You just want to say, God, this is where I am. You know I, 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 you know, I would if I could. Listen, let me, let me tell you something. We're running God's church on a level that's only, that only produces small results and insignificant breakthroughs. People aren't getting real breakthroughs. How do you know? Because many in the body of Christ still need counseling. We still deal with doubt. I mean, that are absolutely unessential. We still deal with not having the desire to pray. We are still dealing with sin. We are still dealing with lust. And let me tell you something, we just need an old-fashioned deliverance service. I'm going to tell you the truth. Where you just get on this altar and you don't get up until you have been delivered. Until when you go back to that computer, you can look at that computer and say, you will be used for the purpose I bought you for and for nothing else in Jesus' name. And you'll be able to go home and declare to your pocketbook and you will never be broke another day in your life. You'll talk to your body and say to your body and you will be healed and you will declare the, and, and, and declare the righteousness of God and the healing of the authority of God. Are you listening to me? Because it doesn't mean, in many cases, what, what, what I'm talking about, that we don't love God. We just don't love God to that degree that is important. It means that many in the body of Christ are a liability. Don't take me out of context. 
Your relationship with Christ has not crossed the threshold of, the, of salvation into living a life of power. What can God use you for when you're unwilling to be used? There's a work that still has to go on in the earth. Who's going to lay hands on the sick? While we're coming in church and, 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 and singing and rejoicing and, and, and we're, we're celebrating anointed people. Let me tell you something. Anointing is not enough. People want this anointing and they want that anointing, but don't know what, it's, uh, what they're asking for. They don't know what they're demanding or, or seeking God for. Anointing doesn't mean that you know God. The anointing doesn't make you intimate with God. The anointing only means that you're used by God. He anointed a donkey. And the donkey didn't know God. We are putting all of the emphasis on things and we're, we're, we're trying to validate ourselves through these things. The anointed Lucifer was anointed. He was the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God. He was closer to the presence of God than any person we know other than Christ. Amen. And he didn't know God. Judas was giving gift, given giftings and anointings of God before the Holy Ghost was ever given on Pentecost. He cast out devils. He gave, God gave that assignment to all 12 of, this, of the disciples. He cast out devils. He went about healing the sick. And he, he experienced signs and wonders. But he didn't know Jesus. So you can be used by God and anointed by God. You can sing until you are emotional. You can literally preach like Apollo, cast out demons and prophesy. You can, you, can, you can dance like a ballerina and still not know God. Because Jesus said, many in that day will say, Lord, Lord. He, said, he didn't say a few, did he? He said, many in that day will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Mm. The Spirit of God ooh, was all over me. And I didn't prophesy either. I prophesied the truth. I knew by God revealing things to me. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not even cast out the demons in your name? And we did all these wonderful works in your name. And then he says, and that's over in uh, uh, Matthew 7 and 23. Then he said, 22 and 23, he said, I'll declare to you, I never knew you. Wait a minute, stop, God. <laughs> wait, Lord, wait, 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 God. I mean... You use me mightily, God. You, you, you use me, and I felt your presence, and I knew you were there, God. Uh, 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 you used me, God. I know you used me. Uh, and God would say, yep, no doubt. No doubt, my man. I used you mightily. <laughs> but I didn't know you. He says, because you practice lawlessness. In other words, you didn't use it for my glory, God is saying. You used it for, your, you took my gifts and my ability and you used it so that you can get the glory. You see, God will let you use the anointing without you ever knowing him intimately. And I'm going to tell you, an empty wheelchair is not, a, is not any proof that you know God. I don't care how many 
uh, 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 crutches you put on the wall, how many wheelchairs are stapled to the wall. That's not any in the, in the indication that you know God. He says, many in that day will say, Lord, Lord. Now that only refers to two, two to three kinds of people. Either Pentecostals, Charismatics, the full gospel churches. Wow. Why? Because they all practice the supernatural. Yeah, yeah. Catholicism don't practice it. Many of your Baptist churches don't even believe in the Holy Spirit that way. They certainly don't believe in tongues. Many people are going to churches and don't know, don't know that the churches are actually Southern Baptist convention churches. Because they were losing members a number of years ago. So, now, some of you don't know this, but being a pastor, I know this, and so you read a lot of things that are going on throughout the history. I've been doing this for 40 some years. And so they were, they were seeing that they were, uh, th there was a decline in their Baptist organization. So what did they do? They reformatted their services. They put praise and worship instead of the choir. But they only have a form of godliness and they deny the power thereof. You see, people like us, we practice laying on of hands. We practice praying for the sick, speaking in tongues and prophesying. And we're the first ones that he's going to say, mm, you're going to have to deal with me on the issue of your heart that nobody's seeing. You see, the Bible says over in Romans 11 and 29 that the gifts and the calling of God is without repentance. That's why people say, well, well pastor, they prophesied to me and, and it, 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 was, it was accurate. That doesn't mean that it was God approval on them in terms of what they did and you're to, supposed to worship them. You took what God may have given to them. You see, Balaam had an issue. Balaam was a, a prophet, but he was a prophet for profit. <laughs> you, 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 don't let me have to go into the story. You got to know the story. Balaam was a prophet and a real prophet. He was anointed to be a prophet. This is why you got to know the one who you are worshiping or anybody can come along and deceive you. You won't be able to know the difference between somebody operating truly in God's spirit of love who has your best interest at heart rather than their own. Jesus is going to say that every person who thought that going to church, singing in the choir, sitting on the church board, uh, witnessing every day, giving that, their tithes and offerings, thinking that the works will validate them knowing God. He's going to tell us, I don't know you. That's why until Jesus, you and Jesus have a yada moment, you really need to have a, go to meet and time with Jesus. When you all have that kind of meeting, I'm telling you, you break down personally. God, when I had, I thought I had that encounter with God when I got saved. I just had a glimpse of God. Are you listening to me? But when I had a real encounter with God, I couldn't go to sleep. And God spoke to me all that night. And for the first time in my entire life, I became faithful to God. I, I didn't cheat on my wife. For the first, are y'all listening to me? Because I'm, I'm, y'all want honesty, right? Can you, can, you, can you stand the pain? Okay. For the first time, don't forget, I told you. He said, if you cheat in Monopoly, you'll cheat in life. Man, I was playing a game just the other day. Boy, did I want to cheat. I was playing with Becky the other day. I was like, oh my God, how do I cheat in this game? <laughs> but I got delivered. Almost 30 years, never turned my genitals over to another woman. Nothing to brag about. Because it had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with him. He's able, he says, I'm able to keep you from 
falling. I said, God, I need you. Because I know I'll fall. And, man, as soon as someone says, it, the, the temptation will be simply an invitation. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> God will say, you never became transparent with me. You, 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 never, you, you, you never got naked with me. You see, don't forget, Adam and Eve were naked with God. When they put on clothes, he kicked them out. Fig leaves are a sign of your excuses. And when you put excuses before God, instead of running to the throne, he says, we can't dwell together. Oh, God, help me. Are you listening to me? I'm giving you this word tonight. Say, God, I want to go deeper. Oh, the Holy Spirit is ready to take us there. You see, many in the church today is simply having an intellectual knowing or an academic knowing of God. Knowing God is the most important thing, but knowing about God is the least important thing. Which one would you rather have, the most important or the least? And as I said, self is not allowed in the company of selflessness. I worship God and I gotta worship him only. I'm just like you, I'm a man just not a woman, but I'm a man just like you. I have the same needs. I have sexual needs, hunger, desires for income, progression in life. There are things I want to accomplish. I can all do so many things at the expense of my soul if I want to. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? I made a choice because I had a real encounter. It wasn't like my first encounter when I met him back years ago when I was 14 and, and, and seven days later backslid. Yeah. Amen. It wasn't like the next time when I met him when I was about 18 and, 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 I, and man, I thought I was going all the way with him. I thought I knew him but didn't know him. How did I know I didn't know him? Because I still did little things on the side. I just didn't want other people to know I was doing them. But when I met him in 1989, don't forget, it was a reintroduction. He came back and now he said, I want to be your God. All the other times I was just, your, I was just an associate. All the other times I was just somebody that would comfort you when you needed me. But I didn't leave you. How many of you know God doesn't just let you walk out of his presence? He know you jacked up. Are you hearing me? But he said, I want, to, I want you to know me differently and I'm coming to yada you. Mm. I, I'm coming to have intimacy. The first thing you know when God wants to come to, and, 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 and begin to have intimacy with you, the first thing he doesn't want is to knock. Because if he's got a knock, he doesn't have access to come in. Knocking indicates you're outside trying to get in. And if Jesus said, I'm on the out, I'm on the door at the door knocking, that means you are inside and he's outside. God gave me a, a perfect, perfect view, and I gotta close. Glory to God. God gave me a perfect view of, of, of our relationship uh, uh, years ago before I had that major encounter. He said, my, now, Michael, son, you know, I, I want to come in, but you let me in, but you won't let me come in all the way. You let me come into the clean areas of your house. He wasn't lying. Because you can sit in the living room all day long. We keep that clean. We even put plastic on the furniture so you can <laughs> put a runner down the rug so you can't put, you know. <laughs> now, that's the old folk now, right? <laughs> we don't do that. But we do that in our lives and we say, God, come on in. You're welcome to come in. Oh, come on, have a seat. Sit wherever you want to. We say, I'll be right back. And we go into our bedroom and we know that place is a mess. 
go into our closet, it's cluttered, and you know your closet indicates what's happening in your head. If your closet is cluttered, so is your mind. And, and Jesus is saying, hey, I'd like to go back there and see what your bedroom looks like. Oh, ho, 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 not today, God. <laughs> hey, let me give you a tour later. Come back tomorrow. In fact, make it two days because I need a professional cleaner to come in here. Are you listening? But, but, but he said, I, I, I want to come in. But God, I can't let you into that place because it's, it's not presentable. Come on, help us, Lord. I, I, I want you in a place where it's presentable. I feel more comfortable about you coming in my living room because it's cleaner, and, and uh, I'll even let you go into the pantry, God, but, but not the bedroom, not, not my office. Please don't research my computer. I'm asking you, God, I, I, I want you to come in, but I just don't want you to come in deep because it will expose the trash in me. I, I know you want to turn my mess into a message, but I, I, I'm not ready for that. I'm not, I'm not ready to deal with that. I still psychologically, God, I'm sort of dealing with things and, and, and we... And, and, and so we, we, we may have let him in the house, but we don't let him come through the house. We don't give him access to all the parts of the house. We want to wait till we feel like we can clean it up. You know, our bathroom is not that clean. You know, uh, it's, it's presentable, but, you know, I, I, I keep, you know, we, we got underwear over here on the floor, socks standing in the corner. They're so stale, you know, God. We, you don't want to see that. That's how we do God. You don't want to see that. You ever say that to somebody? You don't, you don't want to see that. They said, no, no, I want to see it. <laughs> no, you This is what, what God is saying. We're saying, God, you, you, you don't want to go there. You, you know, let, 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 give me time. Give me time. And he says to us, I'm all the time you need. I can do what you cannot do. Let me come in and help you. Okay, God, okay, Lord, uh, okay, Lord, okay, okay, God, G okay, Jesus, you can come in, okay, you can allow the Holy Spirit to come in, but let's just start in, in, in the kids' room, because I can easily validate that that's not my issue. Wow. Wow, sir. It's the kids, not me. I'm not responsible for what the kids are. I tell them a thousand times, clean up your room, clean up your room, clean up your room. So we make ourselves feel like, okay, I'm good to go because they, 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 are, they are responsible for themselves. But, but Jesus says, but there are only seven. <laughs> yeah, God, but I got to give them a chance to learn and grow and live in their mess. He said, oh, like you. like you want to live in your mess and you've discovered you can comfortably live in your mess and not move just like your kids have you ever seen your kids sometimes and you can say how can you live like this have you ever said that to any of your kids or anyone for that matter how can you live like this it's the same thing Jesus is saying how can you live like this I can take, I can, I can just, I can take that thought that enslaves you and turn it into a step that will elevate you if you'll just let me. 
I can, I can, I can take those, that old molestation feeling and, and, and I can empower you over that. That, that insecurity area that you have over there, mm, you, you feel like you, you've tried so many times, but you can't get your money situation right. You can't get your marriage right. You're still going off every now and again. God is saying, if you don't know me like this, if you don't give me a chance, how would you get to know me? I want to come in. I want to yada. I want to have intimacy. Glory to God. And yeah, you can start playing. I want, I want to have intimacy with you. I want your life to change. I want whatever you've had to deal with for you to surrender it, turn it down in the house. For you to surrender all of what he has for you. Can you turn that down in the house, brother, please? Yeah. Can you just say, God, I want you to think, is he standing on the outside of your door knocking? And is he saying to you, I want to come in? Just cut the keyboard. I don't know what's going on with that. Whatever it is you're dealing with, God is saying, I know you, but would you like to know me? Would you give me a chance? to help you get to know who I am. Will you give God that opportunity? Will you stand to your feet, whoever you are? Softly play that music pad that we played before. Glory to God. Whatever it is you're dealing with, Remember I told you God spoke to my heart and said, my people want me, but they don't need me. There's something different when you have this deep-seated desire to want to change, but you can't change because you can't change yourself. I know they say, change your mind, change your life. Yeah, yeah. But you got to be given the right words or thoughts to change your mind too. You got to have the right thoughts. And God will give you his thoughts. Even though you say, well, God, I don't know your thoughts. I don't know whatever. You got to give it to him. He says, he says, I'll give you my thoughts. Because if I endow you with my spirit, I'm giving you my nature, my divine nature. I'm giving you a way that he can take you deeper into me. He can give you victories you've never seen or experienced. Your triumph in so many areas of your life. And there is a possibility that you can, in this life, walk fully in the things of God and overcome all the temptations God is saying, I know you, would you like to know me? Would you like to know him better? Would you like to know him more than what you know him? Not just about him, but know him intimately. I mean, where religion and, and, and you know, having a great time in church is not the premier thing. It's not based on the feeling. 
Because you can feel God's presence and not know him. You can read his word and not know him. Are you hearing me? You got to know that this is your hour for the greatest breakthrough of your life. The greatest breakthrough. I said the greatest breakthrough. That doesn't mean that it's going to be the greatest tomorrow because God doesn't redo anything. That means if you got a great breakthrough today, man, there's, there's going to be another greater breakthrough tomorrow and a greater breakthrough the next day. Are you listening to me? And so, Father, we thank you.